Um, my name is Hassan Hakimian. I'm the director of the London Middle East Institute. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this very special event, the second Qumran Jam annual lecture for 2013. Uh, and it's an honor to have Professor Dick Davis uh, deliver a series of two lectures, the first one tonight, followed by another one on Monday night. My job is very easy and pleasant, welcoming uh, an audience, a group uh, of friends and uh, admirers of, of Iran and Iranian studies. And I promise to keep this very short because you are here to hear uh, Professor Davis. And uh, Nargis Farzad, my colleague from, colleague from SOAS, will do the formal introduction to Professor Davis. <coughs> Um, I just want to say that I appreciate very much your presence here on a Friday night. Uh, and I know that uh, this will be a very rewarding evening. Uh, Dick is a very well-known, eminent scholar, and his name attracts a lot of attention amongst the Iranian studies uh, circle. Uh, here at SOAS, Iranian studies has both deep roots and a long history, which goes back decades. We were told recently that the first uh, lectureship in Zoroastrian studies uh, at SOAS was at SOAS in 1929, and that was a post funded by the Parsi community from Bombay. Speaking of which, there's a wonderful Zoroastrian uh, exhibition uh, downstairs, upstairs, uh, rather, in the Brunei Gallery, uh, convened by my colleague, Dr. Sarah Stewart, and I'm sure many of you will have already seen it, and if you haven't, make sure that uh, you catch that before mid-December when it will be gone. It's a real uh, experience. <coughs> As I said, Iranian studies has uh, a long history at SOAS, but it's my great honor and pleasure to claim that it has received even a bigger boost in the last uh, few years, to be precise, uh, three years since the formation or setting up of the Center for Iranian Studies. Uh, and since then, uh, SOAS is firmly on the map, on the international map, when it comes to Iranian studies. Uh, and um, uh, it's one of the few institutions, if not the only one around the world, which claims uh, expertise across a wide range of disciplines related to Iran uh, and covers over 30 academic colleagues here uh, who are engaged with Iranian studies in one way or another. Not exclusively, but either in their teaching or research, uh, they are uh, addressing aspects of Iran from culture, history, economics, to economics development, uh, law and religion, women, it's a wide range of subjects. The formation of the Center for Iranian Studies, which was one of the initiatives of the Institute, which I had, has enabled us to bring together a lot of energy and commitment under one roof, as it were, and galvanized commitment in this area. And as a result, uh, here in SOAS, hardly a week goes by without us having something related to Iran, and this is really, uh, uh, the range of activities is very wide, from really special events, special lectures like this one, uh, which is now a very special date in our annual calendar, to occasional lectures, to seminars, uh, to film uh, screenings, uh, to concerts, and the list goes on. Now, coming back to the occasion of this evening, uh, the second Kamran Jam annual lecture. Uh, the series was inaugurated with another uh, eminent Iranian uh, studies scholar, Professor Karimi Hakkok, last year in 2012. And um, this is uh, essentially made possible with the generosity of Feri Dunjam Charitable Trust, uh, which uh, very kindly made an award, a gift of two million pounds to SOAS. 
in 2011. Now that endowment is uh, enabling us, the proceeds of the, the returns from that endowment has enabled us to introduce a number of initiatives relating to Iranian studies, um, such as scholarships for BA students, for MA students, and uh, also PhD. Uh, and the MA Iranian studies is in fact, which was introduced, which was uh, initiated this academic year, literally three or four weeks ago, uh, is one of the uh, you know, results of such uh, initiative. Um, we have been able, thanks to the generosity of the Freydun Jam uh, Charitable Trust, to also institutionalize an annual lecture, which as I said is a real uh, special uh, date or event in our calendar. Uh, and I hope you will continue to uh, check our web pages, and if you want to be added to the uh, email list so, that, so as to remain abreast of our activities, uh, make sure you leave your name card or your email sign up upstairs. That would be our pleasure. I know a lot of faces here are familiar, but uh, we always meet up uh, new uh, friends and colleagues, and we want to encourage that. Uh, and I say this knowing full well that London is now uh, arguably one of the hubs for Iranian studies. And I don't just mean SOAS. We have other institutions and organizations, uh, such as BIPS, British Institute of Persian Studies. We have British Museum around the corner, which deals with aspects of I Iranian studies. We have Iran Heritage Foundation, which funds, initiates, uh, again, uh, a lot of activities relating to different aspects of Iranian studies. And in fact, we very closely collaborate with them. So, the topic of tonight's uh, presentation by Professor Dick Davis is the perils of Persian princesses, women and medieval Persian literature. I have to admit, I'm an economist. This is not an area in which I'm qualified to speak. <laughs> but being at SOAS, uh, my job of finding a Persian princess to introduce him <laughs> wasn't very difficult. <laughs> wasn't very difficult, and it's my pleasure to ask my colleague, my guest Farzad, and, I've, and I'm sure she won't be speaking so much about the perils, but the pleasures of uh, introducing Dick Davis, and I, with your permission, I'm going actually to join you, sit at the back and relax, and enjoy the next hour and a half. May I just remind you that there'll be time for questions and answers. We will have roaming microphones, so there will be an opportunity to put questions to Professor Davis. And equally importantly, there will be a reception afterwards at 7.30 or thereabouts, which everybody here is invited to, and I hope you will be able to join us, and more importantly, uh, have an opportunity to interact with Professor Davis. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Afram Khanou. It is a personal pleasure and a professional privilege for me to introduce Professor Dick Davis to you tonight. And as they say, he truly does not need an introduction. And if there is anyone in this room who is not familiar with at least half a dozen of Professor Davis's translations of Persian poetry and prose, or his academic and scholarly writings, I suggest you keep this very much to yourself and set about getting hold of his books before the Monday lecture. There are very few contemporary academics whose works have had such a profound impact <clears throat> on shaping the paths of scholarships, informing the novices and educating the learners in the field of classical Persian literature, as has Professor Davis. He has been and remains an academic authority on the genesis and evolution of Persian poetic tradition. His style of writing in itself is utterly beautiful. 
accessible, and peerless in terms of clarity and elegance. Richard himself, a gifted and published poet, is one of the most acclaimed translators of medieval classical Persian poetry and modern fiction. His translations of Persian poetry range from the Shah Nome, the Persian Book of Kings, Conference of the Birds, Mantorotir by Fariduddin Attar, done with Afham Darwandi, Visoramin of Fakhruddin Georgiani, borrowed where medieval Persian epigrams, and most recently, Faces of Love, Hafiz and the poetess of Shiraz, uh, Jahan Malik Khatun and Obeid Zakani, published just this in the summer. In the field of prose, he has translated My Uncle Napoleon and has written about wine at the Persian table under the title of From Persia to Napa, where he collaborated with Najmi Abbat Mangalij and Burke Owens. He has penned several books about the stories, sources, and the themes of the Shahnameh, such as Fathers and Sons, The Lion and the Throne, Tales of Love and War, Epic and Sedition, and The Legend of Siobash. And of course, not to be overlooked, are his own collections of poetry. In the Distance, A Kind of Love, Selected and New Poems, Seeing the World, Visitations, The Covenant, Poems from 1979 to 1983, Wisdom and Wilderness, a book about the American poet Ivor Winters, and um, more of his own compositions, Belonging, A Trick of Sunlight, Devices and Desires, and most recently, At Home and Far From Home, Poems on Iran and Persian Culture. We can say, Anche khuban hame darand to yek dari. In this, his ninth book of poetry, At Home and Far From Home, he reflects on how uh, association with Persian and Iran stares him, and he looks at himself as a traveler, translator, and for many years, an Englishman living in a country that he clearly loves, but looks at the West with suspicion. Dick Davis has taught in many institutions around the world, including Iran, where he lived for eight years. He was Northern Arts Literary Fellow at Durham University, and then at Newcastle from 1985 to 87. Has taught at the University of Santa Barbara, and he now teaches Persian at uh, Ohio State University, or perhaps Professor Emeritus. When asked in an interview to describe the art of translation, Professor Davis replied, and I quote, I hope I've got this right, that translation is like making love. The process becomes much more pleasurable if you are in love with the object of your fascination. On your behalf, I would like to now invite <coughs> Professor Davis to deliver the first of the two 2013 JAM lecture, lectures on to whom do you beautifully belong, or whose life is it anyway? Women in medieval Persian poetry. Professor Davis. I would like to thank Nargis for that very fulsome introduction. I don't know where she dug up some of that information, but anyway. <clears throat> uh, I'm very grateful to be asked to be here uh, to give the lecture in the JAM lecture series. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Hassan Hakimian and Dr. Nargis Farsad for arranging uh, for my coming here. Uh, and I hope, I hope but after that magnificent introduction, you're not disappointed. Here we go. <clears throat> in the announcement for my talks, I said that in this first session, as well as discussing the presentation of women in medieval Persian poetry, which is my main subject today, I would refer to two other topics. 
One is the relative commonness of women warriors in medieval Persian narratives. And this is rather anomalous. It's, it's peculiar. They turn up all the time. Uh, and I got interested in why they might turn up in both prose and verse, main, mainly in verse, but they turn up in prose as well. And the other is the ambiguous status of the gender of the beloved and the Persian ghazal, which is a very technical, complicated subject. <clears throat> because this latter topic, the gender of the beloved and the ghazal, fits rather better with what I'm going to talk about on Monday, I have decided to leave that topic um, till then. But I will refer to the women warrior question today, though sort of parenthetically, it's not the main focus of my talk. I'm going to talk mainly, though not exclusively, about two 11th century narratives. One is the Shahnameh, which is arguably the most important uh, 11th century narrative we have from Iran. And the other is Vis and Ramin, which is certainly the most important romance from the 11th century. Between the two, in fact, they really define what happened to Persian narrative poetry really from then on. Uh, the Shahnameh directly, Vis and Ramin somewhat by reaction against it. But even so, the Vis and Ramin's influence is comparable to that of the Shahnameh. It, the, the influence is more complicated in Vis and Ramin's case, but it's certainly there. I'll start with the Shahnameh. For a work that purportedly deals largely with warfare and martial heroism and the administration of royal justice and dynastic concerns, which is what the Shahnameh is, all these matters are traditionally assigned in Ferdowsi's period to the public masculine world, and therefore, affair, and therefore they are affairs in which women could be expected to be relegated to minor or non-existent roles. For such a work, uh, Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, it contains a surprisingly large and varied cast of female characters. There are over 50, five zero, there are over 50 women named in the poem. And this is besides those who are referred to simply as the mother of so-and-so or the daughter of so-and-so or the slave of so-and-so. And a number of these women play significant and sometimes primary roles in the narratives in which they take part. And this is surprising for an epic. We don't, and the epic is probably the best word, Western word to describe the Shahnameh, though it does rather transcend uh, the limits of what we usually mean by the word epic. Um, the most obvious way in which women are implicated in the poem's narratives is their role in dynastic concerns. And here we immediately encounter a paradox. And this paradox is very important to the way that women are presented in the poem. The poem lays great stress on purity of lineage as a primary quality for a ruler. He has to be descended from the right people. And a good lineage is seen, as is conventional in pre-modern texts, as the sine qua non for possessing a noble and admirable character. As many of you will know, the word, the word parasa, although it gives us the name Persia, it originally means noble. <clears throat> so you have to come from the right noble uh, origin, as it were. In common with other ep epics, the fundamental conflict of the poem is between a central ethnicity, and here it's Persian, obviously, and other ethnicities with which it comes into contact. It might be thought, therefore, that a good lineage would mean a purely Persian lineage. But in reality, almost none of the major heroes of the legendary part of the Shahnameh, which is the first half of the poem, have such a lineage. They virtually all have foreign, non-Persian mothers. This is important. It changes the way the, feel, the, 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 the way the family feeling of the poem goes forward. It changes what being Persian means, in fact, <clears throat> in the poem. This is true, the non-Persian mother. This is true of the major hero, Rostam. His mother is part Indian and part of demonic descent. <clears throat> and those two tend to, to, tend to sort of merge with each other in the early part of the Shonami. It's true of his son, Sohrab, whose mother comes from the border area between Persia and Central Asia, and he grows up fighting for the Central Asian army against the Persians. It's true of the prince Siavash, whose mother is also comes from Central Asia, and it's true of the prince Esfandiar, whose mother comes from Rum, that is the West, the Christian West. These figures are the protagonists of the major stories of the poem's legendary section. It's also true of a number of the more admirable kings, most notably of Kehosro, the son of Seovash, and he is the paradigmatically good king of the poem's legendary section. His mother is also a Central Asian princess. In fact, Kehosro, who, as I said, is the paradigmatically good king, he is the noble king of the legendary part of the poem, he only has one Persian grandparent. The other three are from Central Asia. 
A number of things seem to be going on in this insistence on the foreignness of the major characters' mothers. It's possible to see the identification of the feminine with the foreign as an underlining of the alterity of women's status in the poem. In the same way that the poem is about Persia, it is about the male world of warfare. And insofar as the foreign and female intrude into the poem, they are to some extent subsumed into one another. The female and the foreign almost become identical in the legendary part of the poem. That is, the non-male and the non-Persian in a poem celebrating male values and activities from a Persian perspective are seen as a single alien entity. Some of the narratives lend oblique support to this notion. For example, the mother of the hero Rostam is both Indian and descended from a demon, as I said. Rostam is sometimes taunted by his enemies with his demonic maternal ancestry. And there is an implication that his less noble traits, and he certainly has some, his hubris, his stubbornness, his contumaciousness, derive from this maternal inheritance. But for all his faults, Rostam is presented as the Persian hero par excellence, the literal savior of his country on numerous occasions, and his faults, whether maternally derived or not, are an essential part of his character. Without them, he would not be what he is. Some heroes make unequivocally misogynist remarks to and, and about specific foreign women. I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, Esfandia rounds on his mother, Katayun, after she has advised him against a particular course of action. Katayun is from Rum, the West, and says that no women can give good advice and that it is useless to consult with them. The Persian hero Bijan verbally attacks his savior, the heroine Manije, saying he doesn't trust her since no woman can keep a secret. Katayun, as I said, is a princess from Rum. Manije is a Central Asian Turk. Foreignness and femininity seem here to be linked and dismissed as untrustworthy. But, significantly enough, both Esfandia and Bijan are proved wrong in their accusations against the women who are trying to help them. Katayun's advice is correct. Esfandia's expedition, which she advises him against, leads to his death. Manege is Bijan's faithful companion through all vicissitudes, and Bijan's king unambiguously reproaches Bijan for his ungrateful and ungracious behavior towards her and tells him he should make amends to her. If individual characters seem to embody or express misogyny, the narratives of the poem neutralize and deny this. And this always happens. Whenever women give advice in the poem, I don't think there's a single exception to this statement. Whenever women give advice in the poem to a male character, it is almost always rejected and the advice is almost always correct. In fact, I think always correct. I say almost only because, only because there might be one I've missed. <clears throat> but it's a pattern that goes through the poem. As soon as some woman, either, either a sister or a beloved, or a mother, tells a hero, don't do that. You know the hero is going to do it, and you know it's going to end in disaster. <clears throat> the female as an aspect of the foreign, and therefore as a double source of anxiety, is certainly to an extent present in the poem. But the narrative's often emphatic exogamy, marrying out, would appear to be there more for political and dynastic reasons rather than primarily as an aspect of covert female-directed anxiety. As a historical chronicle that seeks to aggrandize the culture from which it springs, the poem is concerned with conquest and empire. And this is often symbolized by a Persian prince marrying a foreign princess. In keeping with basic patriarchal values, the male partner of the marriage is seen as the dominant partner and the female as subservient. The marrying of Persian heroes or princes to foreign princesses symbolizes Persian conquest or at least alliances in which the female partner's ethnicity or country is seen as acknowledging subservience to Persian hegemony. We can see this by looking at what happens when the opposite occurs. On the two occasions in the legendary part of the poem when Persian princesses become the sexual partners of foreign conquerors, that is, it's the other way around, uh, the, the women are the Persians and the men are the foreigners, on, on these two occasions, these are the daughters of King Jamshid are captured by the demon King Zahak, and the daughters of King Goshtasp are captured by the Central Asian Prince Arjasp. In these two cases, the relationship is presented as one of rape rather than consensual marriage, and the rescue of the women in question becomes a duty of their male kinsfolk. So Persian men can marry foreign women, but foreign women cannot marry Persian men. But it is possible to see this exogamy in a much more positive light, one that is less ethnocentric and male-oriented, and one that is, I believe, often borne out by details of the narratives themselves. I've spent a long time with the Shahnameh, uh, and as some of you know, I translated it, which took me seven years. Uh, 
and I've written about it extensively. And the more I've studied it and the more involved I've become with it, the more I've realized what a complicated, difficult, not difficult in the sense of hard to read because it's, it goes down like honey, it's extremely attractive to read, but difficult to understand exactly what is going on in it. It's an extremely complex text. And one of the things it does is it presents versions of the world which are contradicted by what actually happens in the poem. It does that over and over again. And it produces this, I think it's actually one of the reasons why the poem is so fruitful within the culture, because it is so interpretable in different ways. For example, it is in some sense certainly a celebration of kingship. There's no doubt at all that the poem is a celebration of kingship. But few of its kings are morally admirable, and many are presented in a very unfavorable manner as either stupid or cruel or both. And uh, in saying that, it's the stupid and cruel kings who Ferdowsi spends most time describing. One king, Kavus, who is the stupidest king in the poem by far, in the standard edition of the poem, the nine volume, the older standard edition, the nine volume Moscow edition of the poem, he takes up three volumes. He's a third of the poem, just one king, and he's the stupidest king in the poem. So it's, it's the kings who don't actually come out of things very well who Ferdowsi is most interested in. Again, it's a text that overtly celebrates patriarchy. It certainly does. But it would be difficult to find a more unprepossessing set of fathers gathered in one place. And when fathers and sons conflict, which they do frequently, the reader's sympathies are almost invariably directed to be with the son. The Persian husband, foreign wife Topos, can be seen in a similarly ambiguous fashion. If, on the one hand, this can be considered as a celebration of Persian and male superiority, it also functions as an enfolding of the foreign and the feminine into the heart of the Persian polity, where both are celebrated and literally produce new life. It is surely significant that a number of the Persian heroes who have foreign mothers are destroyed less by confrontation with outside forces but as a result of devious actions committed by men from their own families. The feminine and foreign give birth to the poem's central heroes, while the domestic and the male lead these same heroes to betrayal and violent death. This is true of the fates of Rostam, Sohrab, Esfandiar, and more ambiguously, but nevertheless certainly the case, Siawash. I want to look for a moment at a number of stories from the legendary section of the poem in which women play a prominent role. Not surprisingly for an epic, these are mainly love stories, mainly but not entirely. Now, <clears throat> I know there are many people here, a number of people here who know the Shahnameh very well, but I know there are also some people here who hardly know it at all. So please, those of you who know it very well, indulge me for a moment. I'm going to tell some of these stories. I'll tell them very briefly. There is, first of all, the, the, the first great love poem in the story is, this love sto is the love story between Zal and Rudabe, who are Rostam's parents. And now, in this story, in this story, Zal is a princess uh, from Kabul. Kabul in the Shahnameh is always counted as part of India. Uh, of course, Afghanistan didn't exist when the Shahnameh was written. Uh, Western Afghanistan is seen as part of Iran. Eastern Afghanistan is seen as part of India. So she is an Indian princess, and she has a demonic inheritance through her father, who is descended from the demon king Zahak. Zal is the son of Rostam, sorry, the father of Rostam, uh, uh, and he falls in love with Rudabe, who becomes Rostam's mother. Uh, he is the son of Sam, who is the, a king of Sistan, which is the eastern province of Iran. And the marriage is forbidden. Nevertheless, the two marry. Now, when uh, the two fall in love with each other, what's most interesting from the point of view of the points that I'm trying to make in this, this, this article today is that Rudabe is as much the instigator of the love affair as Zal is. In fact, if anything, she is more the instigator. Zal is interested in her, but Rudabe actually sends her servant girls to invite Zal to the castle. And when Zal gets to the castle, she lets him into her chamber, and they swear eternal love to one another, and they sleep together. And then, after they have slept together, Zal goes to his father and says, for reasons we needn't go into. You promised you would give me anything I wanted because you were awful to me when I was a child. What I want is to marry Rudabe. And her, his father says, absolutely impossible. She's a foreigner. Her family worships awful gods. And besides, she's defend, descended from a demon. Forget it. Of course, Zal and Rudabe do get married. Now, the point I want to emphasize here is Rudabe's 
independence and Ruda Bey's sort of, um, she's as much the initiator, initiator of this love affair as Zal is. Within the complications of the story, it's quite a complicated story, I don't want to go into all the details, Rudabe's mother, Sindokht, plays an extraordinary part because when Rudabe's, Rudabe's father, who's called Mehrab, hears of the fact that her daughter wishes to marry this Persian prince, Zal, and that Zal wishes to marry her, and Rudabe's father goes into a flat panic because he knows if this happens, the Persian king... <laughs> and he is, in theory, a kind of sub-king, a little kinglet under the Persian king. The Persian king, being appalled at one of his princes marrying somebody from such, with, with such a dubious lineage, as it were, the Persian king will order Kabul to be destroyed. And Mehrab <laughs> threatens to kill his wife and his daughter in order to avert this, to say, it's not my fault, I had nothing to do with this, please don't kill me. It was my awful wife and my awful daughter, look, I killed them. He threatens to do this. In fact, Mehrab is, is contemptible in the story. And Sindokht saves the day. Sindokht goes disguised as an ambassador to Sam, who is Zal's father, and she persuades him to go to Maniche, who is the Persian king, and make it possible for the two to marry. Sindokht saves the day. Now, in both these cases, both uh, Rudabe herself, the woman who marries Zal, and Sindokht, the, the mother, they are the initiators of what happens in, in the poem. Rudabe is the initiator of the love affair, Sindokt is the initi initiator of the political solution to the problem, which for a moment seems as if it's going to end in the destruction of Kabul. The man in the case, that is uh, Mehrab, the father of Rudabe, is presented as a kind of panic-stricken idiot. Sindokt is a far stronger um, uh, person than he is. Now, this pattern of resourceful women achieving their ends, Rudabe wants to marry Zal and she gets him. Sindokt wants to save her family and her country, and she manages it. This pattern of resourceful women achieving their ends, often when the menfolk whom one would expect to be in control of the situation fail in some way, as Mehrab does in the Zal and Rudabe tale, this pattern is repeated a number of times throughout the mythological legendary first half of the poem. What is probably the single most admired love story in the whole poem, that of Bijan and Manige, repeats the topos of the resourceful daughter, like Rudabe, pitted against a brutal father, like Mehrab. And again, we have a rather ineffectual male involved, although here it is the male lover, it is Bijan, who himself, who cuts a relatively poor figure besides the female protagonist. Bijan is sent off to Central Asia to kill some boar, a, a, a herd of wild boar who are ravaging a particular place, which is called Armenistan, which is Armenia. Uh, so he's sent off to Armenia and he kills these boar. And then he hears that there is a spring festival, it's the festival of Nowruz, at which the princesses come and they celebrate Nowruz in a particularly beautiful rural spot. And his companion, who is a rather evil so-and-so, says, why don't you go to that rural spot and see if you can capture a nice princess? In fact, the companion wants him to be killed. Uh, and Bijan says, oh, okay. And so off he goes and um, he sees this beautiful girl in the distance, who is Manishe, who is the daughter of the king of Central Asia. Uh, and he thinks, oh, she's nice, but he just sits there. Manishe sees him, and she sends her, her nurse, very like Rudabe, sending her, her, her servant girls. She sends her nurse. She says, go and bring him over here. I want to see him. And when she comes, she compliments him and, and says how marvelous he is. And they spend two or three days together. And then she says, well, I've got to go home now. And he says, well, I'll go home too. And she says, that's what you think. <clears throat> And she drugs him and puts him to sleep, and he's put in a litter. She hides him in the litter, and she takes, he, she takes him to her father's castle. And he wakes up in the castle, and he realizes he's in the castle of Iran's mortal enemy. And what's more, he's been sleeping with Iran's mortal enemy's daughter. He's not in a good situation at all. <laughs> And he panics, and manages says, oh, forget it, just enjoy yourself. Who knows what will come? Well, what comes is that they're found out. He's hauled before the king, Afrasiab, and Afrasiab wants to kill him at first, but he's dissuaded from this, and he locks him, or he puts him in a deep well, and he puts a great stone over the well so that Bijan can't get out. And Manige then pleads and whines and screams, and the king says, it's, it's, uh, the king is Manige's uh, father, the king says, well, if you're so keen on being with him, be with him. You're out of the court. You're not my daughter anymore. You can go and be his jailer. He throws her out. Manige finally gets news to Iran. Rostam comes and rescues Bijan. But the point I'm making is that Manige makes all the running in this story, exactly in the same way that Rudabe and Sindokt make the running in the Zal story. 
uh, it's not the men who actually um, do the things that make the plot work. It's the women who do the things that make the plot work. There are other examples. The most famous example, perhaps, and it's just one moment in the poem, but it's a very splendid moment, is the mother of Sohrab, who is Rostam's son, who is Tahmineh. Rostam loses his horse when he's wandering around in the border area between Iran and Turan. Turan is Central Asia. And when he wakes up, he, he, the horse disappears whilst he's asleep. He, decide, he follows the horse's tracks, but they peter out in a marsh. And beyond the marsh is a, is a town. And he decides that the, his horse must have been stolen by people in the town. So he goes into the town. He bursts into the king's court. And he says, where's my horse? If you don't give me back my horse, I'm going to kill you all. And the king says, calm down. We're having a nice feast. Have some wine. Don't make such a fuss. Who are you? And Rostam tells his story. He says, I am Rostam. I am the great hero. I am this, that, and the other. And he boasts about all the things he's done. And it's very like, if those of you who know Othello, it's very like uh, Desdemona listening to Othello talking about his exploits. And she falls in love with him listening. And um, uh, Tahmineh, who is the daughter of the king, is listening to Rostam from behind the curtain. And she thinks, my God, he's somebody. Then Rostam is, is half, he's made half drunk and he's sent off to a chamber to sleep and then he's just falling asleep and he realizes that there's somebody else in his room and he says, who are you? And there's a servant with her, with a taper and he sees this beautiful princess and she says, I'm going to quote from my translation, my name is Tahmineh, longing has torn my wretched life in two. Though I was born the daughter of, of the king of Samangan, and I'm descended from a warrior clan. But like a legend, I have heard the story of your heroic battles and your glory, of how you have no fear and face alone dragons and demons and the dark unknown, of how you sneak into Tehran at night and prowl the borders to provoke a fight, of how when warriors see your mace they quail and feel their lion hearts within them fail. I bit my lip to hear such talk and knew I longed to see you, to catch sight of you, to glimpse your martial chest and mighty face, and now God brings you to this lowly place. If you desire me, I am yours, and none shall see or hear of me from this day on. Desire destroys my mind. I long to bear within my woman's womb your son and heir. Now, remember, Rostam has lost his horse. I promise you your horse if you agree since all of Samangan must yield to me. So Rostam thinks, well, I get a nice companion for the night and I get my horse back. So he moves over and he says, Befa, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Here we see clearly not just an equivalence of the lovers, like Zal and Rudabe, Bijan and Maeje, though in, in those cases too, it's the woman who makes the running, as I've been emphasizing, but a relationship in which the woman is unequivocally the instigator of the proceedings. In fact, Tahmineh's coming on to Rostam in this way was considered so shocking by copyists of the poem that almost all manuscripts introduce a hastily arranged marriage at this point before the two sleep together. And uh, in the 1960s, the Iranian scholar Mojtaba Minovi pointed out that these lines, which are in, are, in, are in almost all manuscripts, are certainly an interpolation. He pointed it out on stylistic grounds, on the fact that they don't really fit what's going on, and also on the grounds of the massive improbability of it, that you, know, you suddenly interrupt proceedings to call in uh, 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 Tahmineh's father and a priest in order for them to get married, and then the father and the priest leaves, and they get on with things. And then the Florence manuscript, the so-called Florence manuscript, because it was found in the Medici Library, where it had been catalogued as a commentary on the Quran, of all things. The, the so-called Florence manuscript, discovered in the 1970s, confirmed this. The lines are not in there, though they have been penciled in in the margin later on by some later shocked person. <clears throat> now, in these and other love stories, in the mythological legendary section of the Shahnameh, the women act on their desires and initiate proceedings. They also get what they want out of life, and they get it largely on their own initiative. What is significant, I think, well, many things are significant about this, but I want, to, I want to talk about it from the point of view of the women, as it were, is that there is no hint whatsoever in the poem that these women's actions are to be seen as represent, reprehensible. Rather, female desire and ambition, and any ingenuity and determined use to satisfy it, are presented at worst neutrally, with the non-committal implication of, well, that's how people are, and at best in a positive light. Rudabe, Sindok, her mother, Manige, and Tahmine are all clearly meant to elicit the audience's sympathy and approbation. There is no fuss, for example, as one might expect there to be, about virginity, or the necessity for preserving it before marriage. The satisfaction of female 
love longing and desire inside or outside of marriage is seen as a natural and not a reprehensible course of action. Zal and Rudabe marry, as eventually do Bijan and Manije, though it is clear that Zal and Rudabe sleep together before their marriage, and it's also clear that Bijan and Manije do so as well, and in both cases at the instigation of the woman. Tahmine and Rostam, as we saw, simply sleep together at Tahmine's instigation, and they never marry, despite the interpolated bit in the manuscripts. If female desire entails social risk, which it does in all these tales, it is still presented as understandable and possessed of its own glamour and justification. Now, I see I'm, I'm, I don't want to overrun my time, and I have an awful lot to say. Um, I'm going to skip a bit. There are some uh, stories in which women do not appear in a love story, though they're relatively rare in the Charlemagne, but there are some. The most famous, perhaps, uh, is Rostam's, sorry, Sohrab's, Sohrab's encounter with a female warrior called Gorda Farid. Gorda Farid uh, is a warrior from Iran, and Sohrab, who is the son of Rostam, but has grown up in Central Asia and comes to, uh, in a central, leading a Central Asian army to attack Iran, uh, he is confronted by this female warrior, Gorda Farid, who presents herself as a warrior, and he can't see that she's a woman at first. And they begin to fight, and her helmet gets knocked off, and her hair streams out, and he realizes it's a woman that he's fighting. And she begins to taunt him and uh, to say, come on, you can't beat a woman. What kind of a warrior are you, you pathetic little idiot? Uh, and he gets annoyed, and in his annoyance, he becomes a kind of flustered warrior, and she gets away from him. She tricks him, and then she climbs up on the battlements of the, of the, of the town, which she disappears into, and he's stuck outside the walls, and she climbs up on the battlements and taunts him and tells him to run away because the great hero Rostam will come and kill him if he, if he hangs around. Again, that's an example of a woman giving somebody advice which he ignores and then... It happens. <clears throat> there are other There's one other great example of a female warrior, too, in the Shahnameh, which very few people know about because most people don't read the second half of the poem, which I admit is far less entrancing than the first half, but it does contain some fabulous stories. And that hero is a woman called Gordier, who is also presented as a warrior. And in many ways, Gordier is the most complex female character in the poem. And at least that part of the second part of the poem is well worth reading for the portrait of Gordier. She is the brother of Bahram Chubin, sorry, the sister of Bahram Chubin. And in the histories that were written before the Shahnameh, there are a number of them, she is unequivocally also Bahram Chubin's wife. This brother-sister marriage was very common uh, in the Persian royal and aristocratic families. Uh, and it's, it, it occurs a lot in pre-Islamic, stories taken from pre-Islamic Iran, as we'll see in a moment. It occurs in Bisan Ramin, too, where we, the, the poem almost begins with a brother-sister marriage. Ferdowsi was clearly embarrassed by this because he excises that from the poem. And in fact, there are other moments where Ferdowsi has to record uh, uh, in what we marriages that we would regard as incestuous and that Islam, of course, regards as incestuous, and Ferdowsi himself clearly did, and he clearly gets embarrassed about it. At one point, he actually has to put it in because it's necessary to the plot, and he has a couple of lines in which he says, they did it according to the custom called Pahlavi, that is, washing his hands of it, nothing to do with me. That's what they did then. <clears throat> now, I want to talk now for a moment about this woman warrior question, which has fascinated me recently. Um... Both Sohrab and Sam, Sam is the, is the man, the father of Zal, who Sindokt goes to to kind of save the political situation when Mehrab, her husband, fears that Kabul is going to be overrun with Persian warriors and destroyed. Both Sohrab and Sam are surprised to find that their opponent is a woman, but the poet doesn't register the same surprise on his own or his audience's behalf. That Gordor Farid should fight in this way is presented as somehow natural, and since her skill as a warrior is emphasized, the implication is that she has undergone extensive martial training. Now, you might think that that's an interesting one-off, but it isn't. This instance of a woman warrior who has been trained as such is not at all unique in Persian 11th century texts. For example, the heroines of the 11th century verse romances Varmeg and Ozra and Varge and Golshar are both warriors. Varmeg and Ozra we only have fragments of. But in one of the fragments, it says that not only is she a warrior, as Ra is the woman, uh, it means virgin. Um, most of you know that, sorry. <clears throat> um, but the, for those of you who didn't. Um, uh, as Ra, we are told in this fragment, is not only a warrior, she is the commander of her father's armies. And in Varge and Golshar, of which we have the whole poem, they're both warriors. 
Azra has been specifically trained to be the commander of her father's troops in battle, and Gol Shah kills one man in hand-to-hand -hand combat and another when he threatens her lover. And again, the lover is a bit like Bijan. The lover is a bit of a wimp compared with the woman, who's the real kind of force in, in the relationship. Persian medieval prose romances also contain a number of female warriors. For example, in the Darab Name, the women in question are Homai and Borandokht. In Samaka Eyar, a absolutely wonderful prose romance, they are Sokhvard, Abandakht, and Ruzaf Sun. And in the Abu Muslim Name, they are Majlis Afruz, Bibi Seti, and Ruh Afzai. At first sight, we seem to be dealing here with the Persian equivalent of the Amazon topos, and a number of scholars have said this. But there is a crucial difference between the Persian treatment of this theme and the way it is presented in Greek material and in most subsequent European, medieval, and Renaissance texts. In Greek and later European texts, the female warrior is normally an enemy combatant from an alien culture. Indeed, in Greek texts, the fact that there is such a thing as a female warrior at all implies something profoundly weird and un-Greek about the culture in question. But in Persian medieval texts, including the Shoname, the female warriors who appear are Persian. That is, from the point of view of the poem, they are one of us. And the existence of a female warrior does not imply an incomprehensible exoticism as it almost invariable does in, Europe, does in European texts. It's perhaps significant that most medieval Persian texts which involve female warriors can be shown to have pre-Islamic roots. The one ex exception is the Abu Muslim Name, but in fact, the Abu Muslim Name, despite the fact that it's about an Islamic subject, does seem to have an awful lot of pre-Islamic motifs in it. And I, my own feeling is that the female warriors in the Abu Muslim Name, despite the fact that it's, an Islam, it's a poem about an Islamic subject, that that particular motif comes from uh, pre-Islamic sort of folk narratives. <clears throat> uh, and the fact that the legendary tales of the Shahnameh in particular, these stories seem to have been drawn mainly from Parthian, that is, northeastern Iranian sources. The legendary stories of Iran are of, of the Shahnameh are almost certainly Parthian in origin. They're full of Parthian names, for example, uh, and the geography of them is Parthia. It's not central, it's not um, the, 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 the part of Iran. It's, what, it's, it's a part of Iran that isn't now part of Iran. It's Central Asia, it's around the Oxus. It's that area. Um, the, the, the kind of central um, uh, province of Iran, Fars, is not mentioned in the legendary, in the legendary uh, uh, poems at all, except for one uh, instance, which is clearly a kind of reading back into the poem from a later time. Um, so... The legendary story is an apathy, and this is pretty well established by um, the Iranian scholar uh, Mehdad Bahar, who was the son of the poet laureate Bahara, Bahara and, and also a, a student for a while at London University a very long time ago, and one of the great um, scholars of pre-Islamic Iran. Um, Okay, these stories seem to have been drawn mainly from Parthian northeastern sources. This raises the possibility that in some of the perhaps nomadic tribes of this area, there may in sober reality have been female warriors at some stage of the tribe's historical development. And in fact, in nomadic tribes, there is not this strict division between what women do and what men do. Both tend to do everything. Um, uh, just for kind of practical purposes. It's very difficult if you're on the move for the women to be secluded, for example. <clears throat> I would like to mention a couple of historical tidbits here, though I'm no historian. This is all secondary from things I've read. One is that graves of female warriors are well attested from Scythian burial sites. In some such sites, up to 20% of the skeletons buried with weapons indicating warrior status are of women. Now, the Parthians are usually assumed to be a branch of Scythian culture. In fact, the old name for the Parthians was the Saka, uh, and the name Sistan of that particular province was originally Sakaistan, the place of the Saka, that is, the place of the Parthians. Sistan then uh, went far north of where it now goes. Uh, it went sort of, sort of um, up into Central Asia. Now it's, it's, it's um, much closer to the Gulf. Um, if we go further back, we find that Greek and Latin literature contains a number of references to female warriors being present in Persian armies. These can be found in Herodotus, Plutarch, and Curtius Rufus. The most spectacular reference is that of the prowess of the queen and admiral Artemisia at the Battle of Salamis. Now, this is almost certainly historical. This is almost certainly not story. It's, it's, uh, at which Xerxes said that she, she this, this um, admiral uh, and queen, uh, that she fought better than all his male sea captains put together. In fact, there's a very complicated, detailed description of her fighting in Herodotus. 
<clears throat> the survival of the motif of, motif of female warriors in works which derive from pre-Islamic Persian narratives may well be, I think, a trace memory of a historical reality rather than a male fantasy of outlandish and unnatural aggression, which is how it tends to be presented in Western texts. I'm really running out of time, but I, I want to, to return to the Shahnameh. The positive image of women as individuals who exercise considerable autonomy in their choice of lovers and life partners and are able to direct the course of their own lives more or less as they wish, this image, now this is important I think, it virtually disappears after the advent of Alexander the Great, that is with the advent of history. As soon as we stop the legendary part, when we come into history, the whole, sorry, the whole image of women changes utterly in the poem. They become completely different, and they are admired for different things, and they are condemned for many of the things they have been admired for in the legendary stories. The second half of the poem is virtually all concerned with the Sasanian kings. The Seleucids, who came after Alexander, are not mentioned, and the Parthian kings are skated over in a few pages. Almost immediately, we get into the Sasanians. The presentation of female roles in the Sasanian half of the Shahnameh is arguably more complex and detailed than in the earlier tales, but it is also, paradoxically enough, much more predictable. Certainly, it tends to be less engaging for a contemporary reader, or perhaps for any reader, and often, though there are one or two notable exceptions to this, Gordier is the great exception, it's less aesthetically compelling. The stories are just less beautifully put together. They don't grab you in the same way. The predictability and complexity can perhaps best be illustrated by quoting a speech made by the young Sasanian prince Bahram Gur, when he finally became, who, when he finally became king, gained the reputation of being one of the most hedonistic of all Persian monarchs. He spends an awful time sleeping with people. And in fact, there's one very funny speech in which his prime minister starts grumbling and says he spends so much time on sex that I'm sure he's going to die of weakness in a year or two and he won't be able to defend the country and so on and so forth. Bahram is brought up by an Arab called Monzer who acts as a surrogate father to him. And one day, the adolescent prince addresses his guardian as follows. You are a noble, well-intentioned man, but you hem me in with your excessive care and constant worry. Everyone we see has some secret sorrow that turns his face yellow with grief. And, if a, and a free man's health is revived by pleasure. So allow me this one further pleasure then, the pleasure that cures all pains. Whether he is a prince or a warrior, a young man finds comfort and happiness with women. They are the foundation of our faith. Comfort, happiness, faith. And they guide young men toward goodness and a spiritual guide. Have now... Think of all that, comfort, happiness, faith, guide us towards goodness. Have five or six beautiful slave girls, as splendid as the sun, brought here, so that I can buy one or two of them. <clears throat> I have been thinking, too, that I should have children. If I had a child, that would bring me some comfort, and the king would be pleased, and men would praise me for it. It's not clear whether the complicated incongruousness of this speech for a modern reader, women make us more moral, so buy me some slave girls, think about that, was also an incongruity for the author. Perhaps, but then again, perhaps not. Now, women are here primarily regarded as adjuncts to men's psychological and sensual well-being. They are not there as an end in themselves. They are there for men. <clears throat> they may be morally ennobling, they may exist to provide physical comfort, or they may produce children, but their function is to serve men. This is basically the view of women that the second half of the poem espouses, or at least that its characters tend to espouse, and the poet doesn't seem to withdraw from it. So we have com a completely different view of what women are for, as it were, in the first half of the poem and in the second part of the poem. In the first half of the poem, they're for themselves. They are an end in themselves, if we want to invoke Kant. That is, they, they are sort of there. They are an ethical reality who have to be taken as such. In the second half of the poem, they are there to aid men to be better, to provide men with comfort, and to provide men with children. <clears throat> if one had to sum up in one sentence, and I've got lots of examples of this, but I haven't got time. If one had to sum up in one sentence the difference between the women of the mythological legendary section of the poem and those of its historical section, it would be that the women of the former section generally succeed in confronting the world on their own terms, whereas the women of the latter section virtually always fail if they attempt to do this, and most of them do not even make the attempt, being content to live within a male shadow, either a father's or a husband's. One another point also worth making as 
is, is that the named women in the legendary part of the poem are almost all non-Iranians, I've said that, but as brides and mothers, they are welcomed into the Iranian polity. When foreign women appear in the second half of the poem, they are much less welcome. Miscegenation is now regarded with deep suspicion, and that the Prince Hormozd, for example, uh, has a Central Asian mother, and the Prince Shirui has a Byzantine mother, is seen as, in each case as a distinct negative. That kind of thing was not seen as a negative in the legendary, poem, in the legendary part. A courtier called Simaya Borzin says of Hormuzd, ke in Turk zadeh sazovar nist, beshahi kas uro haridar nist. This man descended from Turks is not worthy of the throne. No one wants him from king as a king, and it's because of his foreign descent. That doesn't matter in the first half of the poem. Uh, Khosrow Parviz describes his son Shirui as bad gohar, that is, of evil lineage. And it's clear from the context that it is the, bo the boy's mother's non-Persian lineage to which he's referring. Ki'in bad gohar taze madar bizad, since this child of evil lineage was born from his mother. The implicit preference in the historical section is for emphatic endogamy rather than exo exogamy, marrying within the family. Although Ferdowsi is clearly embarrassed by the pre-Islamic -Islam laws that encourage marriages within the immediate family, as is evident from his treatment of the daughter-father, homai bahman relationship, and the way that he glosses over something earlier historians unequivocally recorded, which I've already mentioned, that Gordier was married to her brother Bahram Chubinay. Women in the second half of the poem, they seem to fit the expectations of the medieval period in which Ferdowsi is writing. Women in the first half of the poem represent an either fantastic or real, very different kind of image of the role of women, which is much more independent, it's much more decisive, they have much more autonomy. When they do things, they get what they want, and when they give advice, they're always right. That's not the case in the second half of the poem. I'd like to, I'm going to have to do it very briefly because of time. About how much time, much longer? You have, I think, another 10 minutes. So we're not having drinks till half past, but okay. well, leave, some, leave 15 minutes for questions. Then. Okay, sure. 10, sure. 10 more minutes. 10 minutes, okay. I would like to turn now to the major romance of the 11th century, a work written some 40 years after the completion of the Shahnameh. This is Gorgonis Bison Ramin. I will admit that this is a work which, with which I am besotted. I, I read this poem sort of almost by chance. I got interested in something which involved my reading Bees and Ramin, and I read it. And I don't think I've ever fallen in love with the, fallen in love with the poem with such a kind of... It was, it was a coup de foudre. It just hit me over the head. I, was just, I just thought this is one of the greatest poems ever written. I still believe that. It is an extraordinary poem. It's not very well known in Iran. Uh, it's, it's, it's known as, as a poem. People know that it exists, and people know that its rhetoric was very influential in the development of the rhetoric of the romance in, Persia, in, in Iran, which it was. But very few people read it. It's not generally read, and it's thought to be a very immoral poem. In fact, in the 19th century, the word vis was synonymous with whore. Uh, vis is, is the heroine of the poem. But it is, I believe... It's certainly, in my opinion, the greatest Persian romance ever written, and I know that there are a lot of partisans of Nezami in this, in this room. Uh, I do think it's a more interesting romance than anything by Nezami. I know that's, that's not a popular opinion. In my, in my opinion, it's one of the really great romances of the world. I'll, brief, I'll very briefly give you the plot. It's a complicated plot, so I'll really simplify it. At the beginning of the poem, there is a woman called Shahru who is the guest of a king called Mobad. Mobad really fancies her, and he says, I would like to marry you or have you as my mistress. And she says, don't be silly, I'm already married and I have sons. And he says, well, then let me marry your daughter. And she says, I have no daughters. I have no daughters, because, and he says, because any daughter you have will be fabulously beautiful. I have no daughters, but if I have one, and she thinks that she's too old to have a daughter, if I have one, I will give her to you. He says, okay. So they swear to this. In fact, it's written. They write it out. And of course, she gets pregnant and has a daughter, who is Vis. <clears throat> Vis grows up with a nurse who is fabulously described. I'll talk about the nurse in a moment. Uh, she grows up with, this, with the nurse, and she also grows up as a playmate of a young prince called Ramin. But when Ramin is 10, they are separated. Uh, they're about the same age although Vise's exact age isn't given, but they're clearly about the same age. So they've been ch childhood playmates together, and then they're separated when Ramin is 10. Uh, when Vise becomes an adolescent, um, her mother marries her off to her brother, that is, the mother's daughter. This is common in, um, uh, this was common in Zoroastrian uh, uh, royal families. 
Um, this always horrifies people, and when I say this, the room always goes dead silent, which it has now. But if you, you, what, what one should look at if you're bothered about this is there's a, 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 a Sasanian law book called The Book of a Thousand Judgments, which has been translated into English. And it has um, inheritance laws related to the children of brother-sister marriages, of uh, father-daughter marriages, and there is one inheritance law, and this shows how rare this, this, this was, because there's only one, and there are a number of the, of the other, in the other circumstances. There is one inheritance law for the children of uh, mother-son marriages, <clears throat> which is obviously much rarer just for biological reasons, but apparently it did happen sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so she marries, she, uh, Shahru, the mother, she marries Vis off to her brother, who is called Viru. At this point, Ma Mobad, that's the that's the guy who she had promised Vis to, if she were ever born. Mobad appear, Mobad's brother appears demanding that Vis be sent to Mobad as his bride. And there is a war, and Vis's father is killed, or a battle. And Vis's father is killed, and Mobad then bribes Shahru with money uh, and, and the, the, the amount of the, sort of the gifts and luxurious things that, that he gives Shahru to hand over Vis. Vis tries to hide, but she's captured and she's handed over to Mobad. Well, she's handed over, actually, to Mabad's other brother, not the one who came demanding her, but his younger brother, who is Ramin. So Ramin has to take Vis to his older brother, to whom she was promised before she was born, and, of course, he falls in love with her. Uh, and he falls absolutely desperately, hopelessly, hopelessly in love with her, but she's, she's taken to, to Mabad, and she hates Mabad. He's much older than she is. Of course he is. He, he wanted to marry her mother. He's, he's far old. And she says, I hate old age. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not going to have anything to do with this awful man. And she gets her nurse, and the nurse says, don't worry. I know magic. I will make a talisman, and we will bury this talisman. And as long as this talisman is there, and she makes a talisman of a man and a woman who are bound together by copper. And as long as they are bound together, he will be impotent with you. He can sleep with other women, but he won't be able to sleep with you. And she says, great, do it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so this is done. And so Vis does not sleep with Mobad. Ramin, meanwhile, is desperately in love with Vis, and he can't get anywhere near her. So he suborns the nurse. He says to the nurse, tell Vis, tell Vis, tell Vis. And uh, the nurse says, forget it. There's no way, no. I mean, she's already pining for her brother, who she lost. And now she's married to this awful old man, but she's not, she certainly not, doesn't want a third person in her life. Um, anyway, uh, there's an awful lot of that. And finally, the, the nurse agrees to, to work on Vis, and she works on Vis, and it's about a third of the poem, her working on Vis. Vis finally agrees to see him. That's it, of course, they're in love. That's, it's all over them. But on, on both sides, they're in love. And the rest of the poem is the ways that they're separated, they're brought together, the king tries to kill them, they run away, and so on and so forth. The poem ends happily with them as king and queen, and they reign for 100 years, and they have very successful sons who rule the world. Very nice. <clears throat> now, I, I really am running out of time, so the best way, I think, to... This poem is really a poem about women. Let me, I, there's, there's one paragraph I do want to read you, and then I'm just going to read you a couple of speeches by the women so you can see what feisty women they are, and I will stop. Uh, we can say that Vis and Ramin is very much a woman's poem, and in this I think it's unique among Pers medieval Persian narratives. It really is. There is no other medieval Persian narrative that I'm aware of that puts women at the center of the story in this way. In that the women characters in it are, in general, far more vividly and memorably portrayed than are the male counterparts, and given this, it's not surprising that women more or less completely dominate and direct the unfolding of the narrative. If we take the lovers themselves, for example, it's clear that Vis, the woman, is a far more interesting, complex, self-divided character than is her male counterpart, Ramin, who is something of a cipher when set beside her. If we look at Vis's family, it is her mother and not her father, whom we see in various important scenes at the poem's opening, who makes all the important family decisions that generate the plot. It's the mother, Shahru, who promises Vis to Mobad. It's Shahru who tells Vis to marry her brother, Viru. And then she herself marries the two, saying they needn't bother to bring a priest to perform the ceremony. She marries the two herself. It's Shahru who is bribed into handing Vis over to Mobad. Vis's father is absent from all these scenes. We never hear him speak. And in fact, he is conveniently killed off fairly early in the poem. And then there is Vis's nurse, who seems an extraordinary creation for such a time and place. One of the things I've got interested in is there is, I hope I don't annoy any nationalists here by saying this, but it seems to me obviously true, there is a clear relationship between 
Hellenistic literature and, and medieval Persian literature. They use the same motifs, they use the same uh, rhetoric, they use the same metaphors. There is clearly some kind of connection between the two, though I think it's more complicated than just a simple influence from one to the other because the Hellenistic romances themselves are full of Persian stuff. And in fact, um, the, 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 the poetic style of late antiquity in the West was called the Asian style. And the Asians for the Greeks and the Romans meant the Persians. So it was known as the Persian style. So this style, which we see in Hellenistic uh, literature and then in early medieval Persian literature, was seen in the West as a Persian style anyway. But it was also the style of Hellenistic literature. So there is a connection. Uh, and if we look at Vesey's nurse, she is terribly like the nurse in Greek and Roman comedy. She's a kind of amoral fixer of things. Uh, and she, for, for a Western audience, she's most like the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. She's terribly like the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, who is also an amoral fixer of things. <clears throat> and also, if you know Troilus and Crusade by Chaucer, she's like Pandarus. The only male character who's given anything like as much stature in the poem as other women is Vesey's second husband, Mobad, and his chief role is to be her foil. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read a couple of speeches. Um, the first time that V speaks, this is V's very first speech, this is when she finds out that her mother had promised her to Mobad before she was even born. She hasn't been told this. And then she finds it out on her wedding day when this emissary arrives from Mobad saying, this woman belongs to us, give her to us. And V turns to her mother and says, what the hell, what's this about? And her mother says, well, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is, this, this is the first time we hear V speak. V saw her silent mother turning pale like one whose senses falter and then fail and shouted, what's this? Where was your good sense? Where were your wisdom and intelligence? I tell you, you have done an evil thing in promising your daughter to this king. Is this your wisdom? This what you can do? Wisdom, you say, the whole world laughs at you. That's the first time V speaks. She is clearly not a woman to be trifled with. <clears throat> um, there's a wonderful speech um, when or it's not a speech, actually. It's, it's, it describes the internal discussion in Visi's heart the first time she sees Ramin. And she, she really desires him. She wants him. She feels herself falling in love with him. But she feels, for God's sake, you're married twice. You can't do this. And this, this internal dialogue is beautifully presented. I'm, I'm going to read that. And then there's lots more I'd like to read, but we haven't time. Vis gazed at him, and you would say she saw her soul's perfection there without a flaw. And as she looked, the love she'd lavished on Viru, her brother, was instantaneously gone. And then she asked herself, how would it be if I allowed Ramin to sleep with me? Oh heart, what more should I expect of you when you so easily forget Viru? I'm here without my mother and my brother. Why should I feed love's fire now for another? I cannot bear the loneliness I feel. How long I've suffered, I'm not made of steel. I will submit then, since I won't discover a finer man than this to be my lover. These were her thoughts, and with a heartfelt sigh, she thought of all the days that had gone by, but took good care that she did not reveal the fevered love she had begun to feel. She turned now to her nurse and said, Ramin is just as you described. I've never seen a finer man. He's handsome, and it's true he's very similar to Prince Viru, but he won't get what he desires. I might be like the moon, dear nurse, but this moon's light won't shine on him. I have no desire that he or I should undergo such misery. For me, I don't want shame and degradation. For him, I don't want longing and frustration. I wish him well, and may he go in peace and never give another thought to Vis. So what she outwardly says and what she inwardly feels are completely different. But when she came down from the upper floor, she could not see the sunlight anymore. It's a fabulous image. The world goes dark before her eyes. The demon love before Vis could depart had sunk his poison claws within her heart, and quickly from her heart and face he stole color and strength and wisdom from her soul. At times her fancies took her by surprise and conquered her, and blinded reason's eyes. At times she'd think, my cruelest enemy could not desire a nastier fate for me. And then, it's not as though no woman's ever thought love was worth her serious endeavor. And if it's love for someone who's as fine as Prince Ramin, why shouldn't he be mine? But then shame drove desire away and made her feel she should be cautious and afraid. And this back and forth goes on for a long time. I'll stop. But this celebration of female desire, which is similar to but much more extendedly treated than in the legendary stories of the Charlemagne, is something which disappears from the Persian romance pretty well. 
The poem is really remarkable. There's a lot I'd love to say about Wies and Romine, but we don't have time. The poem is really remarkable for its frank celebration of female sexuality, and indeed, a woman's whole bodily carnal existence. Now, Grogany is a man, and this is obviously an act of imaginative empathy on his part, but it is a really extraordinary act of imaginative empathy, the way that he presents this woman's inner life. And not only her inner life, but her bodily life as well. For example, it's the only medieval Persian poem, or maybe any poem that I know of, which describes menstruation. And he does, it does it without either prurience or disgust. It's just given as a fact. The reality of woman's kind of physical and mental existence is something which Gorgoni has really kind of, as I say, it's an act of extreme imaginative empathy, and it's very moving to read. It's, it's extraordinarily beautifully done. Now, we contrast this with later developments. In the poems of Nezami, which I wanted to talk about at some length, but there isn't time, in the poems of Nezami, the, the romances of Nezami, who is, who is the great romance writer of Persian? I, I know, I accept that. He's a, wonderful, he's a wonderful author. But the women are there really as the women were there for Bahram, uh, Bahram Gur. They are there to provide, they are there as spiritual guides, like the women who Bahram Gur meets in the Haft Pekar, and like Shirin in Khosrow and Shirin. They are there to elevate, to, in, to to, to improve the spiritual state of the man who is at the center of the poem. The women are there to serve, to make better the men. Now, they do make the men better. They are not there to sort of subvert the men and drag them down to hell and, and lust and awfulness like that. They make the women better. And in that way, Nezami has been presented as kind of the friend of women in Persian poetry. And he is. He's very tender towards his women. But the women are finally there for the sake of the moral improvement of the hero. The hero is what they are there for. In Vis and Ramin, the women are there for themselves, and the hell with the hero. Or the hero is quite secondary. The men are secondary. The same in the legendary stories of the Shanameng. And then when we get to Jami, who in the fifth, is in the 15th century, the women, in fact, become this uh, stereotypical snare. They represent the body which drags one away from the spirit. In both Yusuf and Zuleika and Salomon and Absal, there is a real horror of, of female sexuality, in fact. Both the heroes run away from women who are trying to sleep with them. Uh, and the women are presented as kind of voracious and destroying. It's very difficult to read Nezami's narratives and not to feel that he's profoundly misogynist, in fact. So a, 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 a genre which begins in Persian as a celebration of the flesh and its desires and of female sexuality in Gorgani, by the time we get to Jami, it, is, it has become a way of transcending the flesh and its desires and a condemnation of female sexuality, which it seems to me is not a very good development, but I think it's the case. Okay, that's enough. Mm -hmm.